Welcome everyone to, to our dynamics lecture. So this is our week. We are on week four now, which means that this week we are going to finalize our topic one, uh, which was vibrations. So this week is the last week that we will be talking about vibrations. And the next week we will start uh, working on 3D kinematics. Right? So, last lecture, last week, uh, we were talking about some applications of uh, one degree of freedom systems and we, we saw that actually we could use uh, quite simple mechanisms, systems, or systems for, for using as a seismometer or accelerometer. So we discussed them and then using these two quite important graphs, we try to explain how and depending on which characteristics actually uh, the mass spring damper systems can act as a seismometer. These two graphs are quite important, um, so please try to have a look and try to understand uh, the principles behind uh, behind using these uh, gadgets, kind of. Quite important. And then we watched a video. Uh, what what was the last video we watched? about vibration. Uh, washing, washing machine, right? It was going out of control. And today we continue with a kind of a relevant example. Is there any party? Is there any party or something? No? All for you? Brothers. Good. Good to share. Good. So I believe this is quite a relevant example today, uh, world example six. So I hope the solution of this, this example will help you to understand the uh, physics behind the motion of the washing machine that we watched last week. We have to be quite careful when we are uh, before we attempt the solution of a, any problem. So we need to read carefully. So we have a 30 kilogram electric motor confined to move vertically. So the motor, bless you, the motor can only have a motion in vertical direction, which is quite an important part of this solution. Uh, we have four springs and one damper here. We know the uh, spring stiffness. We also know the damping factor zeta, which is 15% or 0 0.15. We need to find uh, the amplitude of the vibration when we have a specific omega zero, uh, which is given as 10 radians per second. So, the important point I think here, one of the important parts, the rotor is unbalanced and you need to be quite uh, efficient in mechanics knowledge from last year. So, we need to find what is, because again, there is a force obviously uh, applied on the motor, on the spring system, based on this unbalanced uh, four kilogram mass. So which is kind of simplified as acting on the system like 60 millimeter apart uh, distance from the center of rotation. So this information is quite critical here. Uh, you need to be able to find, okay, 
what is given eccentricity 660 millimeter eccentricity and we have we know the m is for uh, 4 kilogram so and we know that it is rotating with 10 radians per second now uh, you need to think okay i have all those data but but how i'm going to make sense out of it because okay unbalanced system but you know that the system uh, only vibrates or this make a displacement in the vertical direction so you need to think okay uh, rotor this is the center of rotation and about somehow like you know 60 millimeter from distance from this origin there is a kind of four kilogram mass which is rotating at 10 radians per second okay this is fine but how I'm going to extract how I'm going to calculate the force as a result of this motion 4 kilogram mass rotating here with omega and I need to find the force that this eccentric mass can apply in the vertical direction and this requires you to remember your physics lectures or mechanics I mean uh, it's quite kind of simple uh, I think you need to take a note I think uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong you can check the uh, section 17.4 17.4 of our core textbook in order to find out the uh, relevant equation to find out the force due to this eccentricity so let's start first because again this centrifugal force due to unbalanced rotor creates a periodic force on the system which causes the vibration how we are going to calculate this when you will check or not probably you remember now as well so the force actually can be represented by m a n what is a n the normal acceleration okay you will remember again from the circular motion there, there are two types of uh, acceleration a n and a r one is radial component one is normal component so in our case as, as I explained earlier the acceleration component that can create a force in vertical direction is the one is the normal one so we know that we can represent this a n as r omega squared a uh, sorry r omega squared is our normal acceleration so this means again I mean again this is now quite clear we know what is M we know what is R R is the eccentricity or the, the uh, distance from the center of the rotation and Omega zero is given us as 10 radians per second so what does it mean it means that during the rotation this eccentricity gives us a 24 newton force in vertical direction again it is not in only vertical direction but since it is rotating we are only interested in the force in vertical direction okay so again during rotation when it is tangent to the rotation it gives us the maximum force f 24 Newton along this plane so now we know what is the force forcing the system so now we can go for more simple calculations we how many springs were there four so we have four springs and we know the uh, spring stiffness is 200 Newton per meter so in total we have 800 Newton per meter stiffness then we also can calculate the omega omega n natural frequency of the system as 5.164 radians per second so 
what kind of system it was. Do we have force? External force? Yes. Do we have springs in the system? Yes. Do we have damper in the system? Yes. So now you know what kind of system it is. It is forced and force system and also has dampers. So we know that actually you can calculate the amplitude x prime with this equation which will be given to you as a function of omega or frequency ratios, right? And what is x prime here? x prime is the amplitude of the system or the vibration, which means the maximum displacement as a function of uh, or as a result of that 24 Newton force. You just need to input our values and then you will find the x prime maximum displacement as 10.7 millimeters. So, one important thing here, guys, uh, based on, again, my previous experience, most of our students are able to find the x prime or any other equation that they, or formula that they need to use in the solution, and they also can put the values correctly, but uh, probably also with the anxiety of the exam with that stress. Uh, so you may make some simple mistakes when you are calculating. So please make sure that at least a couple times, if you have time for it, a couple times try to check your results. So this is, I think, a quite important thing. One other way, uh, also may be helpful, just, just see, just check your result whether it makes any physical sense. For example, if you would get here like 1,700 meters, it would indicate something wrong, right? Because of considering the uh, dimensions of your system, you wouldn't expect a 1,000 meter displacement here, as an example. So please make sure that you are checking your results. Uh, I mean, this is another question. I believe the solution is also is available on Blackboard. Um, before we continue to our next topic, uh, I just would like you to discuss for a couple minutes on one thing. So here you can see we actually have a quite reasonable 10 mm, one centimeter displacement due to this uh, unbalanced mass. But one of your friends, actually, after the last lecture, he asked me, I am washing my uh, clothes in the machine, and it is not jumping up and down like you know, the one that we saw in the video. What is the reason? What was the reason? What happened in the video? And also try to see and try to explain, maybe next to your friend, what could you do here? What could you do here, maybe? Uh, to get the results in the video, how you would make this motor jump quite significantly up and down, and maybe later on it would get uh, uncontrollable. So a couple minutes, please try to discuss, and then we will continue. Neye? O 4 kilo ama şey, ay, o 4 kilo varmış gibi bir şey yapıyor. O da bir şey yok ya, onu almak için. Sadece kendi kendisi. Sadece kendisi, sen sadece kendisini göz alıyorsun. Çünkü dönme esnasında o... Şimdi neden e, çamaşır makinesi zıplıyordu onu tartışalım biraz.
how, how would you make the system jump up and down? Thank you. So you can play with maybe Omega, Omega Zero as well, right? There are different parameters that you can play with. Right. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for discussion, and I'm sure you found different uh, alternatives for doing so. Uh, maybe you wanted to play with this damping factor, increase it or reduce it. I don't know. Maybe you may need to reduce this. Maybe you thought about increasing the uh, mass or reducing the spring stiffness, whatever. Or you just said, actually, because the omega zero is 10 radians per second, right? So omega n is five, one, six, four. So do you think that if omega zero would be equal to five, one, six, four, do you think this would have any effect somehow? What does it mean, omega zero equal to omega n? So do you think it would? It could make, right? So this is maybe also another uh, way to achieve the goal. So now we, we, are, we are closing our discussions at the moment for uh, or on one degree of freedom systems. And then we will continue with uh, two degree of freedom systems. So here you can see our ILOs, intended learning outcomes. And so far, we covered the first two ILOs. Now it is time to think and try to extend the techniques, the methods that we have learned so far on two degree of freedom systems. So this is getting a step closer to more complex uh, vibration, vibrating systems. So it, it is a kind of a, inter, an intermediate step between uh, three degree of freedom systems or multiple degree of freedom systems that you will be engaging uh, in year three. So I believe understanding two degree of freedom systems will give you a significant advantage when you start studying uh, vibrations, advanced vibrations uh, next year. So, two degree of freedom systems. Uh, how many of you guys check the Blackboard lecture material folders? How many of you check the folder for today? Week four. We have one extra chapter, right? So there is an extra chapter on two degree of freedom systems, and that chapter is actually from the book of Rao. I thought it would be probably quite helpful for you guys to read uh, this chapter. So this is why now it is available on Blackboard. Why I thought this would be helpful? Because if you are studying two degree of freedom systems first time, it may be considered a bit, I don't know, a bit advanced in a way. So also it may be a bit challenging to understand the concept and physical uh, behavior of the system in two degree of freedom systems. So I thought 
reading yourself in your own time may help you. So please try to read the chapter if you think it would be useful. And in our core textbook, we only have one degree of freedom systems. So this is also another reason why I provided you the extra book chapter on two degree of freedom systems. Yes, this is why we are teaching. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you will be assessed on two degree of freedom systems as well. Um, right, so this is another book which is also quite helpful. I also got this book for myself because I forget sometimes some parts of the subject. So I really find it useful to go and check uh, for understanding clearly if, if there's something not very clear. So these are the books, guys. Please try to have a book. Um, I'm going to check the system, but uh, Again, one question. How many of you guys uh, checked or reading our core textbook online? One. Great. Two there. Three, four. Good. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And please all make sure that you are engaging with the textbook because I believe it is quite an important and useful resource. So, we already know that we discussed one degree of freedom system so far. Now we are trying to extend this to two degree of freedom systems. Two degree of freedom system means that in order to describe the motion of the system, you need two uh, components, two coordinates. Because in one degree of freedom systems, we only had, remember, the displacement x. So there was a mass, m. So it was moving right, left, or up and down. And we were able to describe the motion of that m with one coordinate, x or y, depending on the parameters. So one degree of system, one degree of freedom system means that you can define the whole uh, motion with one coordinate. So it makes it quite clear what does it mean two dof. So you need two coordinates to define the motion of the system. For example, you have a car and you can simplify the car with this straight bar and you can think that whole mass of the car, like M, can be concentrated on center of gravity, and the motion can be uh, clearly defined by using the displacement of this center of gravity and its rotation, theta, for example. Or alternatively, I think it gives you here the answer. Alternatively, you can also define the motion of point A and B by independent coordinates x1 and x2. So in any case, if you have two independent uh, variables or parameters or coordinates to define the motion of the system, we call it two degree of freedom systems. Again, this is just one simple example. There are different examples as you can see in the book chapter that I provided on blackboard. So, the reality, honestly, understanding or uh, realizing, like fully understanding, fully grasping all the mechanisms of two degree of freedom systems is slightly challenging than one degree of freedom systems. The good news is that we can analyze the system, two degree of freedom system as well, with the similar mathematical tools. So this is the good news because since you are quite confident now about one degree of freedom systems and it is its analysis, now you can easily extend your skills to two degree of freedom systems. 
as you can see, we are again using three different uh, objects like mass, spring, stiffness. Nothing changes, but this time we have two different like M1 and M2 instead of one M only. Since we have two M, obviously we will have displacement of the two masses and also we have different number of springs and or we may have different number of springs and dampers in the system. However, the fundamentals are the same. What you need to do is you need to be careful when you are checking or when you are developing the free body diagrams of the systems. Once you do that, there is nothing to be afraid of because again, they are the same. And to be honest, maybe you were feeling that, okay, one degree of freedom systems, we know them, we know them from physics, we learned a lot about this, so maybe you want to something a bit more advanced in a way. So once you will master the two degree of freedom systems, you will feel quite confident and it will give you a significant self-satisfaction because it means that you are improving your skills. So I believe this will be the case uh, end of next week. This week, sorry. Because this week we are going to finalize this. So, imagine you have a system, two degree of freedom system, and now you need to develop, imagine uh, or remember what were the steps for vibration, vibration analysis. The first one, we were trying to get the mathematical model, like this for example. Then you were going to develop the free body diagrams. After free body diagrams, you are obtaining the equations. What equations they were? Governing equations. They are governing the motion of the systems. Then you solve them and interpret finally. This means, again, first step and the second step, free body diagram. As I said, if you are careful enough, if you are not rushing, uh, there is no reason you would make any mistakes on that one. Uh, so you can see we have two, like M1 and M2, and you need to put all the external forces on the free body diagram in order to make sure that they are equivalent. Okay? So M1, you see the displacement is right hand side always uh, positive if we are not telling otherwise. So if there is a displacement towards right, the spring will pull it to left. The damper again it is trying to hold it in position, right? So both on to the left. And here K2, spring 2 and damper 2, it is affected by the motion of both M1 and M2. So you need to reflect this in the uh, coefficients of the spring and the dampers here, K2 and C2. X2 minus X1. Why? Because both masses moving towards, towards right. So you need to take the difference between the displacements in order to show the real displacement that spring 2 is experiencing, and the same thing applies to damper 2. At this point, I would like you to again discuss shortly and try to understand the free body diagrams for M1 and M2, and please try to check if anything wrong with the forces with the free body diagrams. So try to see whether all forces make sense and they are correct on the M1 and M2. So please, couple minutes, try to see that.
Anything wrong? No. See the uh, K3X2, for example. M2 is pushed right, pushed towards right. So, would you expect spring to push it back or pull it to the right? So what? What should be? Anything wrong, guys? Still checking, okay, good. Anything wrong in the pre body diagram? No. It may be. There may be something wrong. But Sorry. Anything wrong in the pre body diagram? It may be. Maybe not, right? 50 50. We have chances. Looking for jobs. Good luck. Quite a tough thing, right? Right. So, I think it is a good exercise to see or like kind of imagine the motion of the system. X2 is towards right, correct? Because again, we are assuming that in positive direction they are moving. So if the motion of M2 is towards right, what do you expect? The spring K3, do you think it would pull the M2 or push M2? Push, pull, push. So this force probably towards, it should be towards left. Right. And, okay, X2 is towards right. What do you expect? What kind of uh, reaction do you expect from the damper? Do you think the damper would pull it to right or push it to the left? Push it to the left. But only push it to the left if it was moving. M2 is just moving slightly to right. right? M2 is moving to right slightly. Yes. Yes. The damper, but the, however, damper doesn't really work when you're moving. They don't work when you're moving. Not. Right. So, thank you guys. So, the thing is probably, I think in the earlier uh, edition of the book, the forces are correct. But I think in the final edition that I have now at the moment, uh, it shows this way. So, it is really important. Even published and very prestigious books may have some uh, typos. This is obvious, like, you know, not that they don't know, but it happens sometimes, so we need to be careful when we are checking even textbooks. Good. So, this was another step, getting the free body diagrams. The next step, you just need to write the equation of motion for M1 and M2. Because here, this time, you have two masses, M1 and M2. So what does it mean? You, are just need, you just need to consider Newton's equation of motion, F equal MA, and you just need to put the forces in a good order with the correct sense. When you do that, you will see that you are getting two different equations. The first one is for the displacement of M1, and the second one is for M2. It is, again, a really good practice to make sure that uh, you know how to simplify these equations. And later on, especially maybe now actually you are taking finite element model, finite element modeling. Are you taking it now? F FEM, right. So in the FEM lectures, probably you will see these contracted notations, which are quite simplified. 
but again, it is really good to know that actually, instead of writing them in this uh, long form, you can simplify them in the matrix notation or comp uh, compact form. So this is quite important. But writing only the compact form may be also confusing sometimes, OK? So it is also valuable to have our extended equations, especially when you are new to the, to the topic. So this is why it is really important you to get exposed both the extended versions and also contracted notation of these equations. Right, again, whether you use these equations, two of them, or in this matrix form or contracted notation, they are the same. So now, uh, in the previous slide, we had, again, the all components, K, M, C, all together, uh, it again represented the most a uh, complex form of two degree of freedom system. Now, since we are going to uh, provide a bit more like detailed analysis, we are again trying to use the most simplifi simplified case for two degree of freedom systems. As you can see, we remove the external forces, F, so it is free vibration, no dampers in the system, Right? We only have springs. So for this system, which is again one of the most simple systems for two degree of freedom, we can write the equations of motion as before in two forms for M1 and M2. One thing maybe uh, could be interesting to note here, as you can see, this, the first equation, gives us the motion of M1. So when you know the x here is a displacement of M1. So this is how you define the motion of M1. But important thing here, here to consider is, actually the displacement x1 is also a function of x2. So both springs are affecting the motion of M1. So this is why, why, what we call them as uh, coupled systems. I mean, there are some, uh, again, uh, advanced mathematical uh, formulations to decouple them, but again, this is not relevant at the moment. So the important thing is you need to know that M1 and M2, actually their motion is affected by different parameters, like different springs, for example. So we know that this equation for displacement of M1 and this equation for motion of M2. What we need to do now? Because again, we have the equations, but we know, we want to know what is x, x1 as a function of time. Because if you have the x, which is the solution of this equation, actually, right? Because if you find x here, what is x? If you can, can find the x, it is the solution of this equation. So if you get this equation or solution, you can simply put the time, substitute it in the solution, and then it will give you at which time where the m will be. So our aim is to find solutions for these equations. For finding solutions, we know from uh, differential equations and advanced mathematics as well, uh, and from our one degree of freedom systems too, we can assume that both M1 and M2 can have a harmonic motion with a given omega n. So you are giving a kind of initial disturbance to the system and both M1 and M2 moving with the same frequency. Okay, so this is what we assume before we start solution and once we find the solution equation, it is kind of providing or proving that our assumptions are right. The thing is, 
these all assumptions and their solutions, many researchers spent many years on simplifying and finding these solutions. So no one expects you to understand immediately and come up with like, you know, okay, this is brilliant, this is very easy, super easy, and I understand everything, okay? So if something doesn't make sense at the moment, it is quite normal. As I said, it takes years for groups of researchers to find out, actually, we can assume that. So once we assume that, we can get the results, right? So it is not like simple, and, you know, okay, I got this, not like that. So the solutions that we provide are the results of extensive research efforts. So now, what we are assuming is that the displacement of M1 can be represented by X1, and for X2, we can represent with X2. So it is a bit getting complicated maybe from this point onwards, but again, I will try to tell you what is the physical meaning of it, and I hope this will make a bit more sense. So now it comes substitutions in matrix form and everything, so you don't need to worry about this, okay? Because what I want to you to get here is the physical meaning and try to understand how you can analyze, how you can approach the problem. So again, you are writing in matrix form and everything, and you know that for a trivial solution, it is quite easy, trivial. What, what does it mean, trivial solution? Trivial solution means, trivial, right? If x equal to zero. If you, it is also solution, but trivial, because again, x, if you put x equal to zero, it will still satisfy your equations but it is trivial because it is not giving you the motion of the system. When you give x equal to zero, it means that the system is not moving, stationary. Displacement are equal to zero. But what we want to find is, not that trivial solution, okay, this is also solution, but we want to know what will be the solution for general terms when we want to know, for example, uh, the position of x1, sorry, m1 when t is equal to two seconds, say. So in order to find this solution, the determinant of this matrix must be zero. We need to the cross products here. Then we are getting a four degree, four, four degree equation. So, this equation called characteristic equation, probably you will remember the characteristic equation from one degree of freedom systems. So here we have two degree of freedom system and our equation getting fourth degree. But again, the thing you need to know here, okay, this is the characteristic equation or the frequency because it gives the frequencies of the system. You can call it frequency as well. And it is a quadratic equation again, but in terms of omega squared, because it is fourth order. And it will give you two solutions, omega n1 and omega n2. So based on the assumptions that we made, I think uh, I need to clarify this before we continue. We assumed before we start the solution that both M1 and M2 can move in harmony, kind of, right? And we gave them two different equations here to represent the, their motion, okay? Here, if you find, it, since we find omega N1 and omega N2, it means that actually this system can vibrate harmonically under two natural frequencies. Omega n, you know it was natural frequency, it was a system property. 
for one degree of freedom system, we only had one omega n. Now, we have two natural frequencies. It means that our system can vibrate harmonically under two different natural frequencies. This is quite an important, I think, concept here that you need to be aware of. So now, since you know that our system can vibrate under two different omega n, you can see that we are again making some subscripts or uh, superscripts for our parameters by again assuming that if our system vibrates under omega n1 under first natural frequency, we are assuming that the amplitude x1 for this subscript here, 1 means that this is x1, the amplitude of m1 under omega n1. So if the system vibrates with first natural frequency, x1 gives you the amplitude of m1 under this omega n1, the first natural frequency. And similarly, again, x2, 1 means that, again, your system is vibrating under omega n1, the first natural frequency, and this x2 is the amplitude of m2 under omega n1. Okay? And this helps us to get a kind of R ratio, x2 over x1. Again, guys, so it shouldn't really confuse you. These are just some extra parameters defined to explain the concept in a simple manner. So you don't need to worry. Okay? I will try to explain on a physical system what does that R1 mean. You will see it uh, and you will be able to associate it with the motion of the system, motion of two different M1 and M2, then it will make hopefully much more sense. In a similar way, now imagine that you provided the system in a way that both M1 and M2 are vibrating under omega N2. This time, a different frequency, different natural frequency. Okay? So if this is the case, again, you can write the R2 ratio. Uh, just like, you know, you need to consider that X2 here means the amplitude of M2 under omega N2. And X1 again means that amplitude of M1, the maximum displacement of M1 under omega N2. If your system is vibrating under omega N2, you can write down this R2 ratio as well. R1 and R2 ratios just give us the relative dis distance between M1 and M2 during the motion. I will try to repeat if I can one more time. R1 ratio, for example, your system vibrating under omega N1, R1 tells you what is the relative motion, relative displacement between M1 and M2. So, your system, imagine, under omega N1, and the displacement between two M's is given by R1 ratio. We are going to watch probably uh, Thursday some videos about that, and it will be much more clear what those ratios mean in real life. So, the amplitude vectors, uh, x1, x2, they are vectors, right? They are written bold. So, they are called model or eigen vectors. Probably you will remember eigen vectors, eigen values from advanced high, high, high mathematics, right? So, these are quite important to remember here as well. So, again, the displacement matrices for uh, omega N1 and omega N2 can be also represented in the matrix form. And as I said, they are defining the relative positions of the two 
masses. Right. So if this system is vibrating under omega n1, it is first mode, and if under omega 2, it is called the second mode of the system. And we are going to continue with the worked example 7 in our next lecture. If something doesn't make sense, if you are getting confused, if you got confused, it's a good sign. Thank you for listening. See you on Thursday. Thank you.